Happy Friday, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Foxhole, round two. Uh, very happy to have everyone here again. Probably wait another minute or so to let this, let it fill up a little bit. Everyone gets on here. Um, we're looking forward to, to talking Mexico with you all this week with a couple of very special guests, along with Red Fox's own Mexico crew. Uh, how many do we have so far? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's still going up. We've got, we're up to, uh, 20 folks yeah. so far. Wow. Hi, RJ. Oh, wow. Amazing. Wow. That's cool. Right. <laughs> 27. Yeah. There we go. All right. <laughs> so in all 27 of us are looking at you, huh? <laughs> yeah, looking at whoever's speaking will be on the screen. Oh, wow. We'll pop up the little voice recognition from Zoom. Amazing. Hi, everybody. Uh, feel free to put any questions you have for us in the chat box. We're going to get started in just a minute with a brief overview from Adam Ali Joel in uh, what's been happening with our brand new office in Oaxaca and then chat a little bit about the old days of Mexico with George and Rick. Oh. <laughs> Talk about Mexico in general. <laughs> in days old days. Yeah. Zach, you tell me when we're ready. Let's go ahead and let it rip. Let's let's do it. Okay. All right. Welcome back to the Foxhole, everybody. Hopefully, uh, all of you are finding a little bit of respite in these stressful weeks. Um, and that's the idea here. The idea is basically to hang out, be together, offer a little something up that's that's more fun than the normal course of of our daily uh, work life this week and and what have you. Everything else, of course, on top of that. So this week we have a really special session. We're going to start off with a, a quick update on what's happening at our brand new office in Oaxaca with Adam, Ali, and Joel. And then we have two really special guests, two of my all time best friends in coffee and life in general, Rick Reinhardt, who is the immediate ex yeah. uh, executive director of, of the SEA and uh, George Howell, George Howell Coffee, and one of the original founders of Cup of Excellence. So without further ado, I'm gonna swing it over to Adam and Ali and Joel if you guys could give us a, a, an update about what's happening down in Mexico, that'd be great. Sure, yeah, um, I'll just maybe kick us off here. Uh, welcome everyone, thanks for being a part of this. It's exciting, exciting times in Mexico actually. Um, you know, despite everything that's going on, the harvest has been really good this year. Uh, we opened our office on March 1st in the center of Oaxaca. We really, it's important to us to be right in the middle of the city because there's just a lot of action there. And so we wanted to have a place where Producers could come and drop off samples and come meet and see, you know, see the cupping happening, uh, but also for a place for clients to be able to come and comfortably, you know, enjoy the, the wonderful city uh, and the food and drink and everything there. So, um, yeah, we've been, we've been, I've been since December visiting communities in uh, all parts of Oaxaca and Chiapas and Veracruz uh, multiple times and uh, kind of checking on people. And I think the coffee scene in general is really exciting there. One thing for us that's been, uh, you know, super exciting the past two years has been uh, the opportunity to kind of revitalize the, the Pluma Hidalgo name, um, but kind of through a different supply chain than it than maybe traditionally was. Um, so we've, you know, been, been entering a few different communities that uh, is in, in the southern mountain range of Oaxaca. Um, Zach, maybe this would be a good time to throw the map up real quick to kind of bring a little context to that. Um, but they, they call it Sierra Sur. It's the, the, the mountain range directly south of the city of Oaxaca before you get to the Pacific coast. Um, and there is a town called Pluma Hidalgo uh, in the Sierra Sur where uh, many estate farms were established um, 80 years ago or so. Um, and then, but, but coffee, smallholder coffee farmers have been growing coffee there probably longer than any of the estate farmers in some of the surrounding uh, small towns and communities outside of the town of Pluma Hidalgo. Um, so 
Yeah, what we're excited about is being able to help some of the smallholder farmers in some of these little towns here with uh, marked in the blue. Yeah, zoom in would be good. There we go. Um, yeah, so you can see Oaxaca City, the capital, is right in the middle of the state. And then down these blue dots are little towns where, where coffee's growing um, at pretty high altitudes, in some cases up to 2,000 meters. Um, and it's some of the, they have the, the primarily, I would say, 80 to 90 percent of the, the varieties I've seen on the smallholder coffee farms is all Pluma Hidalgo variety, uh, which is, a, you know, a local mutation of Typica. Um, and some of it is really, really healthy and really, really thriving at 1800 or 1900 meters um, down there. And so uh, I think what Red Fox has been really excited about building is a new supply chain from the farm level up in, in order to, um, you know, bring some of these coffees to market, separate them by their town names, but, but calling it all under the denomination of Pluma because there actually is a board now that is certifying all coffees from the whole Sierra Sur as, as Pluma coffee. Um, That's great. So, yeah, I don't, maybe we could throw it to Joel real quick. Uh, see, I think today he actually cut some samples from one of our favorites, which is Osola Tepec. Um, there's actually four different Osola Tepecs. Uh, each one, there's San, Santa Cruz Osola Tepec, San Juan Osola Tepec, San Francisco Osola Tepec, and San Antonio. Um, and they're all um, little communities kind of surrounding a bowl, but at some of the higher altitudes in the Sierra Sur. Um, it's been one of our favorite in terms of profile and uh, an ability to to get um, kind of buy-in from farmers out there. But yeah, I don't know. Joel, do you want to talk about how, how some of those are tasting? Can I jump in real quick with a question before we do that? Please. Just I'm curious what kind of variety these folks are growing out there and uh, and what kind of altitude, more or less, I know, more general, but... Yeah, I mean, the, the majority of it is what they call pluma variety. Um, so as a local mutation of Typica, they call it Criollo. If you go out there, the farmers themselves will, will say it's Criollo. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, you know, um, but they, they'll, they'll refer to it as pluma or Criollo. Some of them have Bourbon as well, but predominantly in this specific area where you're seeing those blue dots, it's, I would, from what I've seen, 80 to 90% pluma, a little bit of Mundo Novo, uh, some have Catura, uh, lately, there's been some uh, efforts to introduce new varieties that are potentially leaf rust resistant, um, but that don't necessarily uh, maintain the pluma profile, which is something I'd love to get into uh, later. But um, the altitudes that we're buying are between 1,400 meters and 19, almost 2,000 meters in the, in the San Antonio Oso de Tepec, I would say, is the highest altitude that we know. Um, another really lovely town that we're, we're buying coffee is San Sebastian Coatlan. Uh, and that town itself is at 2,200 meters. Most of the farms are just below the town. So around 1,800, mm -hmm. 1,600 meters is growing there, but um, all from Pluma variety. From so, so high above the equator. Um, great, thanks. Joel, what's your take on the quality this season? Yeah, so just, just quick. Been super interesting learning the different profiles here. I, I think, um, you know, as a as a real short uh, sort of overview, I, I feel like most Mexican up to very recently was just kind of blended into these maybe 83, 84 point regional uh, bulk lots that didn't really have uh, a lot of differentiation. And, uh, you know, not so different than Peru just a few years ago. So uh, it's been really fun to see some distinct areas emerge that are just uh, vastly different from each other. And, and so the range of profiles are from, you know, the average super approachable, like dried fruit, maybe raisin, date, just super clean, sweet, going all the way to some more fruit forward profiles. But, but not, not getting into the, the acetic uh, vinegary, just really just clean, beautiful fruit. There's, there's quite a range here. That's great. One Is there any massive difference that you see from village to village, like within Osolotepec or even between Pluma and Mixteca and elsewhere? Certainly between Pluma and say like some of the Mixteca or Yosotatu, you know, like the Yosotatus I think have more of a 
sort of top end can even exhibit florality. Uh, the, the plumas, um, it, it, I don't know, San Sebastian Coatlas, I see a little bit of difference there. Um, Ozolotepec, yesterday we kept up a, just a gang of them and there, there's, I don't know that I would say a, a distinct from other regions in Pluma, but just so sweet. Like it was, again, we were like, how, how can this, it's the kind of coffee you could drink all day long. Really just nice. Great. We have one question that kind of fits in here uh, from Kristen in Denver asking, what kind of education we're bringing to coffee farmers, which is interesting and uh, maybe a point of contention within the industry. And I think we have our own approach. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that, Adam, I'm also happy to jump in at some point. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the education starts with a conversation around quality, right? I mean, I, I think our what we're trying to do is um, bring these producers into the highest paying market, uh, essentially, you know, uh, allow them to access the people that can pay the most for coffee. And that has to be through cup quality. So our education is around what varieties we generally score or what varieties that we see score, because most of them want to ask what variety to plant. They've heard that they're, that so-and-so is giving out free, you know, seedlings or seeds uh, for certain varieties. Is that any good? And we, we, we try, we, you know, we at first say we're not agronomists, it's not our, our main role, but from what we taste in the cup, generally what we score are higher are Bourbons, Tipicas, Caturas, uh, these varieties that, uh, you know, may be less yielding, uh, lower yielding, but also can, can be resistant from what we've seen. So uh, it starts around that. I think a lot of it, uh, mostly what our conversations around in terms of like education and opening their minds from, from traditional practices is in drying. Um, a lot of these, places uh, have tended to dry their coffee super fast. And so we first and foremost take water activity and moisture readings on every sample we get. And if it's not in spec, we don't even cup it. So we, t we tell farmers that straight away. You know, if, you're, if your coffee has been dried too quickly, it's gonna show up on water activity. And we know that that's a coffee that's not going to arrive to market in the same condition. Uh, so a lot of it is around, I think people understand the ability to pick ripe and they do pick ripe. And they, they understand, you know, clean, good, wash coffee process, fermentation and washing. Uh, but the drying tends to be something where um, because of market forces or what, what have you, they've been drying away too fast um, in, in most cases. And so talking about strategies in order to slow down the drying, if they can't quite build a raised bed yet, um, which would be the ideal, then to, uh, you know, increase the level of parchment on their patios. Um, in terms of like the, the, the depth of parchment and turn it more re readily, slow down the drying to at least eight to 10 days, whereas before they would have been maybe doing three or four days. So um, that's a, a big part of our education. I don't know if I'm missing something. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good answer. I think to supplement that answer, our underlying philosophy at Red Fox is that none of us are agronomists. agronomists. None of us have been trained in that field in any regard. What we do have is in the collective decades and decades of experience buying coffee, uh, experiencing the way one community in Yurgachev might do it differently than a community in Weiwei Tenango versus a community in, in South Colombia, you know? So we've seen a lot of things. We have a very basic notion of what's good and what's bad, uh, but we rarely, rarely insist or demand that coffee farmers do anything that's too far out of spec from what we're comfortable in asking for. Uh, because ultimately, they are the ones carrying the risk in trying to bring their product to market. We want to create the necessary incentive for them to earn as much as possible in the market. Uh, so we have suggestions from time to time. But as far as educating a farmer on anything other than what the market desires and what their opportunity is there, I don't know that we have uh, a whole lot that we could responsibly add to the mix. Um, that's my two cents. We uh, do know that we pay the best prices. For Rick, but if you had something to add to that, feel free to chime in at any point. I, I would uh, just say that I think it's an admirable approach to this. And, uh, and one of the things that uh, I think has been missing a lot from the typical interactions between buyer and seller here. I can't tell you how many farmers over the last three decades have said, if you would just tell us what you want, we would deliver that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's the principal thing we can do as buyers is, is give a clear communication of what it is that's attractive to us as buyers. 
rather than to try to chart the course to get there. If we can identify the destination first, then we might be able to work together to chart the course there or to seek professional uh, and knowledgeable input from agronomists and others who have, uh, have real knowledge. Yeah, that's great. You want to jump in, George, or should we? Um, yeah, I, I, I love your approach. It's, it's exactly right. We're not agronomists, and so it has to be general, as, as you say. Um, of course, some people are giving advice to uh, in other regions that um, I think lead, lead uh, growers into wrong directions with really dark cherry and that kind of thing, which you and I were discussing, right? Yeah. Right. Um, these coffee, the Yosotatu that I'm getting, which is that a Pluma coffee? That's a Mixteca coffee from, uh, or Adam, go ahead, please. Okay. So it's not. Yeah, not technically Pluma. It's uh, from the Mixteca region, which isn't really well known necessarily, but I think it does produce some of the very best cups. In, it's in extraordinary. The um, very, quite complex, very surprising. Also very about 80% Tipica and the rest would be, it's only Tipica and Bourbon and around 18, 1900 meters as well. Right. right. I did a quick share, sorry to interrupt, of just the Mixteca cluster of yellow dots versus uh, ah, the blue cluster of okay. um, Pluma. I see. Wow, very interesting. <laughs> so Mixteca was not that well known. It's always been Pluma. That's what I've always been aware of, not Mixteca. Yeah, yeah, Mixteca has kind of been a, you know, in the last maybe 10 years from, from my experience working down there has been the one that's kind of emerged. Um, and we're trying to revitalize the Pluma because, you know, I would love to hear from you, George, like what were your, some of, some of the impressions of your, you know, experiences with Pluma, you know, many, because in, in my, in my thinking and my understanding, it was really in its kind of heyday in the 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, maybe early 90s, somewhat. The, it's sad. I mean, they, they kind of, for me, they kind of committed, uh, or at least the people I was dealing with sort of committed suicide, really, because um, I was getting it in the middle 80s, approximately, um, you know, from the area. It was just sold as Pluma, not a particular co-op or anything else. Um, and I remember the beans to be long and, and large, um, somewhat like a Hawaiian Kona would be. Uh, that kind of shape to it. Really beautiful looking beans. Um, but the flavor... And it, it makes sense, being a blend like it was, was a basic coffee flavor, a kind of a milk chocolate note to it, milky, um, very soft, very similar actually to a Kona, uh, sort of a generic note to it, but very, very smooth is what I remember. So we did want it. Uh, but then uh, the coffee came into us. Uh, I was ordering back then with Coffee Connection, I don't know. 60 to 100 bags and the uh, the coffee that came in had uh, every fifth bag had rocks and uh, dried cherry in it <laughs> and at that point we gave up um, you know and I could never really rely on Mexican coffee more recently and it was always I did I did have coffee from other areas of Mexico my favorite was very clearly the Oaxacan coffees. Uh, they were just cleaner. They were more distinct than, than the other coffees. They had more balance to them. Um, but, you know, we're talking, what, 30 years ago? So it's kind of hard to be more specific. Um, yeah. And then more recently, uh, 10 years ago, I was arguing with certain importers who were working with co-ops uh, in Oaxaca and begging them for special lots. And the argument there was, uh, no, we can't do that because we'll reduce the quality of the overall lot. And that was very frustrating. Um, you know, so I never, I never got the coffee because it was just too generic to get uh, at the time. So that's yeah. sort of the extent of it. I think that's kind of the history there, you know, and, and from what I've dug into a little bit in Pluma, especially, you know, the, the, the main marketing and promotion came from some larger estates, but I think the reason why their quality was actually pretty good is because they were buying from the small, smallholder farmers further up the hill 
and it was improving their quality. And then, you know, I think uh, was uh, Rick would definitely be able to answer this question, but there are some really dif difficult market dynamics in what, 90, 91, 92, something like that. And also the internal coffee board in Mexico disappeared. Um, many of those farmers just abandoned their farms, the larger farmers. And so the smallholder farmers were kind of left either join co-ops or sell the coyotes out there or whatever. But the history has always been blending coffees and not separating just as you said, because people think that it'll reduce the value rather than add value to the ones who probably most need it. Um, but yeah. Right. And, and the moment you, you get farmers to really strive for higher quality because they're getting better prices, you're actually going to improve the blend as well. I um, mean, absolutely. that was the issue. Rex, should we let you jump in? Yeah. I don't know that I'd add a tremendous amount other than to note that, uh, um, Mexico in general has suffered from uh, that sort of uh, neutrality. It, you know, the best coffee, the best Mexican coffees for a long time, at least in my recollection, were defined by being sort of clean, sweet, and sound, uh, much as George described. Lots of milk chocolate notes, good, solid coffee, but you'd be hard pressed to find a dimension or an attribute to really hang your hat on and say, this is the defining characteristic of this coffee. And um, as a result, they got used for a lot of things you would expect those copies to be used for. Uh, I think I made an offhanded comment to you some time ago, but in you know 30 years ago, Mexican copies in general were uh, bl were blenders, French roasters, and flavor bases, uh, which you know those were those were a class of scripters for coffee at that time, and uh, they suffered a lot from not having the distinctive notes uh, and taste of place that you get by careful separation. That, you just touched on something interesting there. The the roasting of those coffees back then, were they were they considered soft? Could they take heat? What were they like in that regard? Uh, God, back then is so different than today. Even in the roasting concept, uh, we were still fairly light roast. Um, again, it was very much like a Hawaiian Kona. It's that size bean. Uh, so it's between soft and hard, really. It's not as hard as, as the tighter uh, Caturas, Bourbon, and so on, right? Because these are more typica than anything else. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Do you so, have any thoughts on that, Rick? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's true. I think they were were not particularly dense coffees by and large. Uh, there was, you know, by the the nature of how those coffees were, if you were buying mill runs, you know, stock lot coffees, uh, they tended to be fairly homogenous. And every now and then you'd get the, an odd lot that was a little denser than others. Um, there were um, more from Chiapas than from Oaxaca. There were um, a few estates that were, you know, single origin single estate farms that were, you know, producing some coffees that were pretty dense uh, and pretty interesting. Um, but as Adam mentioned, in 94, uh, when the market bottomed, uh, most of those folks, I think, uh, sort of got uh, wiped out in one fashion or another. Right. Uh, and uh, it, it was a tough to recover from. But I, I think, George, you must have been buying some Finca San Carlos at some point uh, back in the early 90s probably um, no uh, I wasn't uh, I wasn't in the business in the early 90s that was um, that was your gap yeah I sold in 94 right so, yeah so I, yeah I, I, I have this memory of actually cupping coffee at coffee connection after before you sold and after you uh, expanded uh, the plant huh. there because uh, <laughs> I actually remember you giving a, a particular broker a really hard time for some San Sebastians that had arrived well under spec. <laughs> uh, bingo. Yeah, it's more like that. I know I wasn't buying any for a long time because I just couldn't find what I, something that was really exciting. Um, you know, uh, before that, the, the best, the best co Mexican I got was really uh, from uh, Erna Knudsen. And that was, as I say, earlier in the 80s. So cool. Wow, yeah. interesting. Very cool. Another but thing I, I find... The other interesting thing is that the best Mexican coffee I had up until Aleco came on the scene were coffees that I would taste in Mexico proper. <laughs> they oh. seemed to have an internal network that was very different than our network from outside of Mexico. Uh, all credit due to Adam and Manuela for that. 
Yeah. But, uh, great news to hear about red pox for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really interesting dynamic in Mexico these days, even more than ever, is their their internal roasting market is so strong. Their consumption yeah. internally is incredible to see every year. Um, and, and the number of cafes just walking around Oaxaca continues to grow every year. And I mean, in, in Mexico City, you'll find coffee bars that, you know, are as well designed and, and with as quality of service as you find anywhere in the States. So, uh, yeah, it's I think that's a really interesting dynamic. It's also, you know, in, it translated to higher prices for farmers um, too, which I think, you know, is, is only a good thing. It's helped improve quality of the field, having a local roasting market and things there. I agree, George, I've, I've had some incredible cups of Mexico in Mexico that we're, we're also trying to introduce to roasters and, and have and have been the last couple of years, but it's just, I think there's a lot more room to grow there. It's, it's exciting. One thing that I, I thought was interesting about Pluma in particular was that it was literally down the road to a port um, in the 80s. That port has since closed. So I think mm -hmm. the access of, of being able for the, a lot of, there was a lot of dry mills in Pluma that would just mill coffee and ship it straight from Pochutla, the, the, from not Puerto Escondido, but Salina Cruz was a port there. But I think it was called Puerto Angel, which is right by Puerto Escondido. Oh, yeah. Coffee, coffee would ship out of it. I know it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but that, it's not a working port anymore. So uh, yeah. as sort of, I think, you know, in some of the ways cut off access to some of those coffees and now everything either has to go to Veracruz primarily or maybe up to Montanillo. But uh, yeah, I think that was an interesting part of why, you know, I was curious, you know, how in your mind, like why these, some of these coffees are able to create such a brand and a name for themselves in the market. You know, it starts with quality, but it just becomes something that people look for. I mean, whether it's Antigua or Supremo or whatever, or something like that, it's just sort of like Pluma to me, like it, any taxi driver in Oaxaca or anywhere in Mexico will just say, Oh, if you, if you work in coffee, have you ever heard of Pluma? Do you know the Pluma coffees? I mean, it's yeah. like branded internally as well as in the international market. So I, that's kind of fascinating to me. That's right. It had a big name in the 80s and, uh, you know, into the early 90s. Uh, I just wish I could have gotten more of it. Uh, you can now. Yes. Yes, indeed. Well, yeah, I got to look. I got to check out more plumas at this point and have the two of them, the Misteca and the Pluma. Um, and I wish I could have been in Oaxaca with you guys a few weeks ago. I, that went well, I hope. It did. Yeah. I don't, maybe Ali and Joel can comment on that a little bit, but we, you know, we were sort of in the midst of it. We actually had to make a kind of a, a tough call to not visit the community. Um, just sort of like seeing all the news roll in. Zach was down there too, actually. Um, we, you know, right. planned to cup all the coffees and drive up to the indigenous communities and reward the farmers for the, the higher cupping scores and stuff, but sort of seeing how fast things were spreading and probably knowing that any one of us could, or people that have been coming from the states or other places could have been a carrier of the of the virus um we the last thing we wanted to do was potentially introduce anything to those communities that have no health care or anything like that so we we called off the trip it was it was a, a great week in terms of the quality on the table um i think i scored some higher higher scores in outside of coe than i've ever given in mexico uh, but then also having to cancel the trip and not be able to interact with the farmers uh, directly on that in that week uh, was was a, was a tough one. It's kind of a, a new time right now, so that's yeah. a great call. Yeah. I'm curious what uh, what Ali has to say about the brigada as well. Ali is tucked away in the shadows back there. <laughs> Ali is the director of Red Fox Sourcing Company, so she's running our our deepest operations that are in Peru and in Mexico. Uh, Doing, doing some of the, the toughest work that we do. Ali, what do you think about the Brigada? Um, one thing I found fascinating about the Brigadas and then just in general about Mexico is how small the lots are. So um, like some of the samples we're getting are 40, 40 kilos of parchment, 30 kilos mm -hmm. of parchment, 50 kilos of parchment. Um, and just sort of all the work that's go gone in, Adam has made such a big push because there's so much distrust in in Mexico and producers aren't willing to just deliver their coffee off the bat. And so we've actually changed the whole way that we, um, that we receive samples in some parts of Mexico so that farmers will send in a sample just from their farm for us to see if we're, if it's like a profile or a coffee that we're interested in. And then once we approve that sort of farm sample, 
they'll deliver to the warehouse and we'll pull another sample and make sure it's inspect both physical quality and cup quality wise. But I thought the Brigada really highlighted that in terms of just cupping through so many different coffees in preparation for it. And then I think we probably cup through about 80 of these smaller lots just to get things on the table um, wow. for the Brigada and then starting to put those together. And so sort of what Adam was highlighting earlier about how in the past, you know, those, those better coffees just got blended together. It's, I think it's a big opportunity for us um, and for the producers to be able to start picking those out and, and putting them into, um, you know, sort of showcasing them on their own. Yeah. Amen for that. We have, do you have something to add, George? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. No, I just said amen to that. I mean, yeah. What a difference. Yeah. We have- I have a question for, for, actually for your team on the ground there. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it seems to me that over the last sort of decade and a half, maybe even longer, the, um, one of the shifts has been about the intensity of farming from the smallholders that uh, in Oaxaca in particular over the last, uh, this last, Oh, at least the last decade, that farming has become a less and less and less intense activity uh, for smallholders. Are you noticing that that's true on the ground? Uh, is, uh, is that shifting at all? Is it becoming uh, in, in any way more of a uh, intensive farming uh, scenario, or is there a potential for that, or should there be? Less intense? I'm not sure if I'm following exactly. Yeah. So a, a lot of coffee uh, in Oaxaca, in my recollection, um, was cultivated as a matter of more of a matter of habit than practice. Um, uh -huh. There were existing coffee trees, uh, some of them quite old. Um, they were producing, but there wasn't a tremendous amount of husbandry in market in persistent market lows, almost no inputs. Um, and then uh, harvesting tended to be less concentrated. So the net impact that is you had, um, you know, uh, coffees that, that again, were not intensively farmed. They weren't rigorously maintained, pruned. Uh, almost, almost Ethiopian garden style in a way. Yeah, almost semi-forest, uh, although they, you know, they were clearly were planted, uh, they were planted uh, trees but there wasn't a lot of new implanting, you know, really not a lot of intensity, a lot of farming intensity at all. And, and frankly, many smallholders had other on-farm and off-farm activities that were, were sort of the backbone of their, of their daily existence. Uh, and coffee was a sort of accidental cash crop. Um, and I don't know if that's still the, the situation on the ground. Adam, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it's a really interesting dynamic there. I mean, I think that almost culturally speaking, the farmers see farming coffee as a way to participate holistically in, in these processes. I mean, I think shade grown coffee is, is, is cultural there. It's not necessarily a practice. It's what they, you know, they feel is the right thing for the coffee and the right thing for, the, you know, the earth. I think there's almost like, you know, similar to what I've seen in Peru, there's this like a drive for this just uh you know um identification with organic not necessarily a certification but as doing things with holistic practices uh, i there are still a lot of those farms as you mentioned that are basically just default this is what's been growing for the last 30 years they just keep picking almost less and less every year um an interesting dynamic that i have seen is that a lot of those farmers were migrant farm workers in the u.s um, up until maybe five or six years ago seven years ago uh, when the border crossing, the annual border crossing to go, uh, you know, pick grapes or asparagus or onions or whatever started to become way too dangerous and extremely costly. Many of them decided they were going to stay back and not not make that that crossing. I'm speaking particularly about the Mixteca right now. I don't uh, in Pluma. Uh, um, I think uh, it's sort of a different dynamic, but in the Mixteca. Um, I think a big reason why that region has emerged more through quality is because many of those farmers are now stayed in in their communities and are dedicating solely to, to growing coffee. They might have a couple other activities, but they, and the reason why a lot of the lots we're seeing this year uh, in the last couple of years have been so small is because a lot of them have done complete renovation of their farms. 
Um, and they are replanting with the local, you know, Bourbon and Typica varieties that exist. Some of them are planting geisha as well, but many of them have resisted the newer varieties that have been introduced, uh, like Oro Azteca or Marseillaise or some of these varieties that some people are not familiar uh, or not proven in, the, in, those, in, those, in those lands. But so a lot of them are, are more actively, I think, um, managing nurseries and, and replanting on their farms and planting slightly more densely and maybe managing the shade canopy a bit more rather than just let it grow. So I, I think that you're starting to see a little bit and that becomes, it's not because anybody is necessarily providing technical assistance out there. It's because some farmers I think have brought some ingenuity to it and are bringing a bit more action to it. And I think you're actually seeing because of the migrant, um, the lack of migrant influx workers, you're seeing a, a bit of a younger generation out there, uh, particularly in the Mixteca, but also in Pluma as well. Uh, whereas maybe 10, 15 years ago, average age would have been in the 70s. Uh, I think now it's bringing down the average age of these farmers because they're, they're basically committing to staying and doing coffee and because they're seeing price premiums. Uh, I can speak to our supply chain. I know we pay the highest prices around outside of auctions um, and farmers that really incentivizes them to reinvest in their farms, uh, try to hit consistent quality year after year and then get better yields with the, with the varieties that we have identified that we score higher and pay more for. Um, in Pluma, I think it was an area that, uh, what was it, 2000, uh, Hurricane Paulina completely wiped it out. It was completely wiped out by a hurricane. Small horde of farmers persisted, they're still out there. Um, and I think uh, then we saw leaf rust hit that area really hard. Um, but again, I've never seen th this, this Pluma variety something about the land there, the climate, it, and as George mentioned, the beans are bigger, the leaves are bigger. It doesn't look like the standard typica you see in other places. It's, it's a healthier, more hardy plant. Um, and it seems to be thriving out there again in, in some farms, not every farm, but some farms, particularly with some of the younger farmers that I think have come in with a different interest and in kind of managing more heavily. I'm getting long-winded here, but uh, it, it's, a ba it's a balance of all that. Is there, has there been any impact economically on the shift or the, the newer generations coming in or this shift to, to more intensive farming in certain areas? Is it measurable? Um, yeah. I think we're starting to see that. I think we're starting to, I, I wouldn't say that necessarily yet, but I think the prices that uh, have been paid through our supply chain and also through COE and also frankly through local roasters that are paying really great prices. Um, you see uh, people buying up more lands, whereas before they may have had one or two hectares. Now they're buying a bit more, so they have two or three hectares. Or they're taking over uh, an ant's land. And the indigenous communities, there, they're not allowed to buy and sell land. They're only allowed to kind of get approval from the whole community in order to farm another piece of their family sort of allocated lands. Um, so I, I see people reinvesting a bit more in that side of things. And to me, that's a good sign. Um, the C market's been extremely low. So the standard for, for the lower tier qualities and probably lower grown coffees, I, like production seems to be way down. Uh, many of the estate farms that sort of the lower end quality as, are continuing to not really produce coffee anymore. And they, were, they would have been the ones who would have been more technified. The smallholder farmers, I wouldn't say they're, they're getting technified yet, but they're more actively managing the farms. And I see that because they're able to invest a bit uh, through price premium, but I don't know. That's great. That's great. Uh, I know we touched on this in the beginning, but Matt from Carrier Coffee is asking about uh, what kind of financial or knowledge-based infrastructure is available for improvements at the farm level. For example, race drying beds. Uh, asking similarly when he went down to Cusco with us last year, visiting Valle Inca, uh, and there were people whose role within that co-op was to spread these best practices. Are we doing anything similar in Mexico? Uh, well, actually one of the first years I was buying in the, in the Miramar and, and Yoso Tatu communities in the Mixteca, we, I did a raised bed drying workshop um, bought a bunch of materials, had some people develop some plans and drag the materials up there in a van. And we did, you know, two different designs of raised beds. Since then, we've seen some people kind of tweak those designs, obviously, to, to meet what they're able to, you know, materials are able to get. Um, it's slowly happening and it mostly happens from peer to peer. You know, I, I don't, 
frequently unless you show people the money, uh, which we, we are, but again, in small volumes, uh, and, and particularly in the Mixteca, the plan is, this is only our second year purchasing Pluma. Um, we're starting with two communities this year where price, where second payments with price premiums are being introduced for those coffees. Um, yeah, I think that the next steps have, have got to be doing more of these types of workshops and going in, you know, hand in hand with some people to invest in it. When some people build, build the raised beds, other neighbors, their neighbors see that it's possible. They see where they get the material. They understand where it's going to cost them and they start to build it. Um, yeah. So let me jump in. Uh, that's a really good answer. Again, going back to one of the underlying mantras of Red Fox here. Uh, our, our goal is to pay the best prices in the communities we work in. And that's virtually always the case with very rare exception. Um, we want coffee farmers to look at their farms as their business because that's very much what it is. You know, getting back, getting away from these ideas of subsistence only. Uh, that in the sense of looking at it as a business, if they're reinvesting in their farm, they're able to generate more revenue and hopefully drive more money to the bottom line over the course mm -hmm. of time. That's really it in a nutshell without getting too deep into this thing. So that said, we pay the best prices. We talk to them about how they can make improvements to their farms in very small ways, the ways that we're very confident in. Again, going back to that original statement about not being agronomists, you know, the things that we're very confident in uh, knowing actually help improve quality. But it's really up to them to determine how they want to spend their money because it's their money. You know, uh, the idea is not to send a whole lot of charity back versus create incentive yeah. for better coffee by paying the best prices that we possibly can there. Uh, right. That makes sense. Uh, that makes a lot of sense um, to my mind. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask a, oh yeah, the, um, during the, uh, the, the harvest time, is that a dry period? Completely dry? Is there any rainfall during that time? Adam? Um, yeah, I think in certain places it's super dry and Sierra Sur, uh, Pluma um, and Mixteca tends to be quite dry um, all of January through April, even probably starting in December. Uh, you see a bit of cloudiness here and there and we actually see drying slowing down when there's when there's clouds that roll in, but there's not any notable moisture that falls. But there's other microclimates, particularly in Oaxaca in the north, Sierra Norte, and then what they call La Cañada, which is kind of the northwest corner of the state near Puebla, near closer to the Gulf, uh, Veracruz, um, where it rains a ton. It, do, it doesn't stop raining until March. Um, and they had, they struggle with drying. We struggle being able to buy those coffees because they come down super wet and the yields are really, really poor. Um, Chiapas, I would say there's a bit of a mixture. Um, uh, primarily it's dry and hot. Um, Veracruz, I had one of, in December in Veracruz is one of the my coldest nights of the entire year it's raining and freezing there um but uh so I, I, it's a, and again we're I, i'm only we've red fox has only been working in barracruz for this is our second year now so it's a little bit new to us oaxaca is where we've had more time but there's a lot of microclimates this is a really interesting place but uh, mixteca pluma tend to be very very dry um maybe with a little bit of cloudiness here and there um yeah, I, by the way, you won't see my, I don't think you're going to see my photograph, at least I can't, because something happened. So I can hear you guys, but I can't see anything anymore. You can so, hear you, George, which is great. Um, so it's interesting. So you're trying to get them to dry coffee in about eight to 10 days. This is, uh, this is on patios still. Um, and I, I presume the patios are, um, are concrete or something like that, not plastic. Concrete, or are they doing yeah. it on plastic? Concrete, and many of them use what they call petate, like the reed mats. Um, yep, yeah, okay. Exactly, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And then a question that I have is, um, you know, a lot of people are saying, hey, coffee should be dried for 20 days and so on. But in a dry, hot climate like that, isn't eight to 10 days fine? Might be one for Joel. Uh, I mean, I guess from what I would say real quick is that with raised beds, we can easily see 20 days even in that climate um, right. and some stable coffees. Although we have seen a few people that are doing raised beds, this is interesting. 
just yesterday, I'm looking at some of those results from some of the farmers in Miramar that I know for a fact dry and raised beds been dry for more than 20 days. Their coffees are literally too dry, <laughs> like 8% or, or lower. Huh. So uh, something happened there. I don't know. Uh, whereas last year, he did the same process and his coffee was perfect at like 10%. So um, Interesting. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that just takes longer. But the results you're getting from the patio coffees are pretty good. Yeah. Joel, I don't know if you have something you want to add to that. Well, I mean, again, I want to preface it like we have several times. I'm not an expert in drying. I, I, I don't live, live on a farm. I just I measure and taste thousands of lots every year. So right. that's, that's my only experience. And, and um, what, what I can say is there, there is no right answer. I don't think longer is better. In fact, I've heard if it's too slow of drying, it kind of reabsorbs the moisture and it, it can become more volatile and, and, and have a higher water activity. Um, we definitely know that too fast isn't good. We, we, I can only speak to trends and even within those trends, there are always exceptions. So um, I, I, I generally, I feel like eight to 10, you know, if it feels right, more is, is the moisture content lining up with the water activity where, where we want to see them, that we know that they will have some longevity and also be uh, more easy for our customers to roast. That's sort of what we're looking for. Yeah, I hear you. I, I very much agree with that. Uh, again, based on cupping, tasting coffee, keeping them, um, you know, the eight to 10 days coffee lasts very well um, over a long period of time, we find. So it's been a question of mine. Uh, you know, without any clear answers yet. Um, I think we probably have five, maybe 10 minutes left here before we should wrap this thing. We have, you know, the big question, elephant in the room question here, which would take an hour or so probably to unpack. Um, I'm going to throw it out there in case anyone has some <laughs> anecdotes to it. Uh, again, from Kristen in Denver. Is it too soon to discuss how the current global crisis is affecting the market or its potential future? Mm. Uh, um, let's leave it at that for now. Oh boy. Well, I had Rick's on the, on the horn for this one. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, Rick, but I know you have at least a line or two there. Well, I, I, first thing I would say is uncertainty breeds volatility. And that's the, that's the, the short answer to the what's happening in the market in the near term. I mean, the swings have been enormous over the last uh, the last uh, sixty days. Um, coffee um, coffee has a couple of things working in its favor in the sense that uh, it tends to be relatively uh, resilient in the face of economic downturns. Um, so people tend to drink coffee even when things are not going well economically. We've seen that happen repeatedly. I'm not sure. Typically what happens is the, the venue of consumption changes. So people switch from drinking coffee out of the home to in the home when, when there's economic challenges. We're in a different dynamic in a whole range of ways. One is, is that out of home consumption is, is bottomed out to next to nothing because of the nature of the, of the, the medical emergency, the, the nature of the virus. And for the first time, we're seeing um, an enormous amount of coffee consumption on a global scale that's relatively new. So, um, you know, we haven't added a lot of new consumers in the traditional markets in Japan, in the U.S., and Europe. Those consumptions have been consumption been growing somewhat on the back of more frequent consumption, but not a lot of new consumers. The bulk of the world's growth in coffee consumption has come from new introductions, new, new introductions into the consuming marketplace. So particularly in origin consumption, but also in emerging economic consumption, especially in, in Asia. And we don't know how durable or resilient that consumption will be in the face of a, a massive economic challenge. Um, and obviously highly complicated by uh, the health challenge that's, uh, that's the driver of this. So lots of unknowns, lots of volatility. Something that's more sort of uh, intriguing to me to try to get an answer to is what's happening on the ground. And we're hearing uh, sort of anecdotal reports, hearing anecdotal reports that um, 
labor is severely challenged in, in much of Brazil, um, starting to become yep. a huge challenge in Colombia. Um, uh, lots of labor is imported, particularly in, in those two countries from places that are distant from, uh, from the, the production zones. I don't know what's going to happen. I've heard estimates that as much as 20 or 30 percent of Brazil's crop may go unharvested because there are insufficient, uh, insufficient labor there. And yeah, I can't imagine what that's doing in Costa Rica. Et cetera. Yeah, yeah, people are unable to move to be migrant workers in the way that they were in the past. So we may have a, a net shortfall in production. I mean, if, if Brazil really was short, even, even if Brazil was short 10% of their anticipated production, that shifts the balance uh, of coffee supply from a an, an long position to, to a net short position. So a lot of unknowns here, a lot of uncertainty. And I think you're gonna see the market continue to be very volatile based on that level of uncertainty. Uh, in the longest term, my own outlook is that this may provide the kind of inflection point for coffee that it looks like it may provide for lots of societal assessments about how we do things and why we do things. Um, and it may, to, may well represent the shift in the sort of generational influence um, that uh, the incoming generation of leadership and consumers uh, takes, uh, takes the forefront and, and and moves the outgoing generation out of the way. This kind of global uh, uh, activity, this unusual global situation often um, is what drives that kind of generational shift. So I, I would anticipate that that's the longer term outcome of this. Yeah. That's a really amazing insight, thank you. Uh, couldn't imagine possibly adding something to that right now. I mean, from, from the perspective of Red Fox, I suppose I will. Um, we're taking this thing day by day, week to week, um, speaking with as many different people across the trade as we can to get a grip on this thing yet, but we're not, uh, we're barely touching the ball. Um, it's yeah. gonna take a week or month or two to really understand what the actual impact is gonna be on the coffee market and the specialty side where we live. Um, so TBD, maybe ask that question every week for the next, uh, handful of foxholes. Yeah. Uh, just uh, really thank you very much, Aleko, for, for your involvement in coffee and your real focus on, on micro lots. Um, it's essential. And, you know, if I would ask roasters to do anything at all it's to really focus much more on single farm and regional than on blends uh blends renders everything uh, anonymous and no matter uh, how much they put the list of different coffee farms uh in the blend on their bags or whatever it's sort of like listing the ingredients to a, a recipe for food it's a grocery um it's for important it. i think that really that again, single farm be emphasized and regions, uh, you know, so if you've got a lot of Mexican uh, coffee from Oaxaca or whatever, you're selling it as Pluma or something like that. That would be cool, but not, not as blends. Anyway, my own two cents. Thank you, George. We, we always love your two cents and hope for as much as we can get. Uh, very grateful to have you on our side and to be working together. Um, uh, great enjoyment. Yeah, I think we should wrap it here, if that's okay with all of our panelists. Call it a Friday. Um, thank you both. Thank you, Rick. Really appreciate having you. Thank you, George. Uh, great to talk to you as always. Just so everyone's aware, we're going to continue to do this every Friday, 11 a.m. PST. We'll be publishing these on YouTube and on our website. Uh, you'll be seeing all of the news out there from us. Uh, I hope everyone's hanging tight. Be well. Thank you all. Thank you, Aleko. You got Thanks, it. Thanks, Aleko. Everybody. Cheers. Take Thanks, care. Cheers. Un abrazo.